Back in the 50s, people in this country really didn't know what the world outside Europe looked like. Images from Singapore or Bangkok or Bali or Timbuktu were like the other side of the moon. 50 years ago, I was a young television producer in charge of what the BBC then rather grandly called its Travel and Exploration Unit. Actually, what it consisted of was me and one other person, and we took film from travellers, essentially amateur film, from distant parts of the world. Every now and again, we commissioned a film, and a group of undergraduates from Oxford and Cambridge turned up in the office and said they were posing to drive from London to Singapore. They sounded as though they knew what they were talking about, and I thought we'd take a risk and give them some film. This program uses that footage never before shown in colour to reconstruct a journey through a lost world. Wars and revolutions have made the voyage impossible today. It was a feeling of uh, high adventure. We hadn't the faintest idea of what we were going to do. We didn't like the way they carried their weapons, and at one stage I think Tim and or Nigel sort of took over the weapons from them. It certainly was a challenge that we hadn't anticipated. You know, we were very sort of probably overconfident, almost to the point of arrogance. Early in 1955, six young men formed an expedition team. Each was assigned a specific role. Any expedition needs to build a team. It's not at all satisfactory to have a group of friends. So the recruitment was done on the basis of various tasks that people needed to do. They needed a cameraman and photographer and so they asked me to recommend somebody so honestly I chose myself as a geographer I knew about maps and therefore I suppose I brought the navigational skills along I fancied myself as a bit of a writer, though I really hadn't got much experience. But I had done my national service in the Far East and uh, knew a bit about those parts. So we were a sort of polyglot bunch. I think four out of the six of us had done our national service. We weren't in any way qualified. Uh, I don't know how one would, would qualify anyway, but the arrogance of youth, we, we reckoned we could do it. We reckoned we could do it if anybody could do it. The team proposed to drive nearly 18,000 miles from London to Singapore. This had never been done before. The main problem was People had driven from London to Calcutta, no problem at all. In fact, the record at the time was two weeks. Others had tried to go further but had failed. Um, and the reason they'd failed is that there was really no way through Burma. Before the war, there had been no roads. Uh, two military roads were built during the war, and it was generally accepted that they had lapsed back into the jungle. For any chance of success, the expedition needed a vehicle which could last the distance over difficult terrain. There was only one contender. We went to the Rover Company and we said, look, how about a couple of Land Rovers? And um, amazingly, they came through. And once we had the, 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 the uh, BBC and the Land Rovers, <coughs> then all kinds of other sponsors came in. We had 83, I think, sponsors, ranging from the Land Rovers to the makers of uh, whiskey. 
We'd put uh, six to eight months work into um, the gestation of the thing and now I suppose if there was a moment of birth it was actually going aboard the aircraft at Lim Airfield in Kent. On September the 1st, 1955, the team began the first leg of their historic journey. Back then, the easiest way to get the vehicles across the channel was by air. There was some excitement, you know, we felt at last we are really on our way, we're no longer just talking about it. This is it, this was a sort of moment of truth and as the aircraft lifted off and, you know, one saw the fields of uh, England sort of disappearing under the wing and then the, then the channel, yes, this was a moment of mild excitement, mild excitement, I think. Uh, it was a feeling of uh, high adventure. We hadn't the faintest idea what we were going to do. Uh, we were a group of people who didn't really know each other. Even in the preparation period, we had uh, each had a separate task, so that we'd only sort of come together on the runway, more or less. As part of the sponsorship deal, the team had to promote their trip to the foreign media. When we got to Paris, the French television say, we want you to do something typically English. How about brewing up tea? So we said, all right, we'll brew up tea if that's what you think English people do all day. We decided it should be done on the uh, bottom of the Eiffel Tower. So we impressed ourselves and everybody else and baffled the spectators by brewing up tea in our billy can. The overland route to Asia meant passing through the Balkans. We had to go through Yugoslavia, which was a communist country, but not uh, Iron Curtain. And uh, so we were a bit uh, dubious about uh, whether we would uh, have any political trouble. I think I was the only smoker and I was given quite a lot of cigarettes by one or other of the manufacturers. The cigarettes were very useful to be, uh, to give to border guards and people who, you know, just might be able to ease our passage a little bit. We drove down this newish autobahn from uh, the north of Yugoslavia down to Belgrade and um, we might have passed um, 20 vehicles in two or three hundred miles. And all the children on the roads were waving to us. BB, I think, um, said we must wave back and bring fraternal greetings from Cambridge to the People's Republic of Yugoslavia. So we duly waved back. <laughs> The Land Rovers drove through Greece and into Turkey until they reached Istanbul, the gateway to the east. In the 50s, places like Middle East and beyond uh, seemed as remote as remote. Now, of course, uh, it's rather different um, because now package holidays will take you all over the place. But then, when you got the idea that someone who you might have known, who might have lived next door, could have driven there, that seemed absolutely amazing. We had two new rules when we crossed the Bosphorus. One was no lettuce uh, beyond the Bosphorus, and the other one was, if you've got nothing to do, boil water. Lettuce being uncooked was uh, frequently uh, fertilised by uh, human body fluids, shall we say. So we thought it would be extremely imprudent to uh, consume them. The Bosphorus is, uh, as it might be, the Rubicon. Once we left Europe and got into Asia, this was the beginning. And it was a full speed ahead. One 
Once we got into Turkey, the roads began to, on the whole, be not so good, and the distances got to be greater, and the countryside got to be more open and more arid. And then going through southern Turkey, you realise you were in a different world completely. And then you get round to Syria, um, and it's definitely very, very different indeed. There was a bit of a joke with, within the six of us that um, we were quite frequently saying, well, this is the last meal before we leave civilization. But I mean, this is <laughs> a, a, a blatantly incorrect. <laughs> I mean, you know, we were, we, in some ways, we were moving into civilization when one goes into the Middle East. We were diverting, of course, to go and see sites uh, and film uh, um, different places along the way, Crusader castles, at Baalbek, oh, many, many other things of that kind. So we had a program, sort of, which we were stitching together to, to, to enhance the, the film that we were making for the BBC. The simple practicalities of travel were a constant preoccupation. One's concerns were immediate. Uh, how far is it to the next place? What's the fuel situation? We've got enough water. Uh, let's find a decent campsite for the night. Rather than, as one might uh, wish, the, the sort of broadly philosophic, which, which really didn't, uh, didn't concern us too much. When we're in the countryside, when we're out on the desert or near desert, we would camp just by the side of the road. And uh, it was cold. I remember it was quite cold at night. My job as cook was to make the soup and make the breakfast. And I had to get up first. I slept in the Land Rover rather than on the ground in camp beds. We got up usually about half past five. We wanted to start early because the, the heat of the day is very great. So I would get out of bed, um, light the uh, petrol stoves and um, brew up large quantities of water for the day in which we made tea and the porridge. Always had porridge. BB always made porridge. And the big advantage of porridge is it's quite filling, it's easy to make, and you can get compressed um, oats uh, in a tin, which uh, sort of fluffs up. A small tin lasts many days. And although you can see sometimes on the film people uh, eating with some disgust at the porridge, the uh, consequence of that would be, well, you can get up early and you can make the porridge or you can make something else. The team headed for Beirut, which was then the Middle East's most glamorous resort. We thought of Beirut as being the Paris of the Middle East. We understood that they spoke French, uh, and that they had a nice veneer of French culture. Um, they had a lovely climate, and we arrived there, would have been late September, I think, yes, and we learned to water ski there from the Saint Georges Hotel, which was the well-known hotel. Some of us water skied, but only Adrian had ever done any. We stayed a night in a girls' school. Unfortunately, the girls were away on holiday. Beirut was our first sort of really relaxation point. Very sophisticated people and a bit of flesh pots really which when one thinks about Beirut, everything that Beirut's been through since seems extraordinary because you know, the place has been the scene of, of civil turmoil. And... 
But to us, Beirut was a marvellous place. Three years later, Beirut erupted into a bloody civil war that would wreck the region for decades. The next major challenge was to cross the 400-mile stretch of desert to Iraq, at this time still a monarchy on good terms with Britain. The journey from Damascus in Syria to Baghdad, and it's always been a bit of a barrier, I mean, going back to you know, biblical times, it used to take four and five weeks to get mail into, say, Baghdad. A couple of New Zealanders thought they could do better than that. They started a bus service. The problem was to get buses built which were rugged enough, so they built them themselves. And these became known as the Nan buses because the two brothers were the brothers Nan. Of course, it's long since disappeared now, but uh, we took deliberately, spent two or three days in the workshop seeing these things being built and then travelled uh, overnight. They always went at night because it was cooler. Marvellously impressive to see the way the drivers in the loom of the headlights could... Because there's no road. And, uh, you know, they'd, they'd swerve to round sand and rocks and this and that and the other, and then the dawn had come up and one was running into Baghdad. On arriving in Baghdad, the team stocked up on valuable food supplies. Three years later, the pro-British regime would be overthrown in a military coup. The expedition now crossed the border into Iran, where they had a meeting with the Iranian army. With Western support, the army had removed Iran's nationalist government just two years earlier. Rovers were anxious to pull off a big deal with the uh, Persian army, because in those days it was much more commonly called Persia rather than Iran. And we were asked to demonstrate our vehicles. So we went out to the army proving grounds and we chose various quite tough bits of terrain to drive over. And we ended up going up a very, very steep hill. We found that we couldn't get up some of these steeper inclines in forward gear. Uh, but we could backwards, which uh, amazed the uh, spectators how versatile these vehicles were and how successful at uh, going backwards. If you can't go forwards, you can always retreat. The Iranian army was so impressed, it promptly ordered 500 Land Rovers. Today, it may well be true that um, every stretch of the journey is better known than it was at the time. But in fact, I doubt it would be possible now to do that because the world has, um, has, has divided itself against itself uh, and there are plenty of places now where you will not be allowed to cross the frontier. So this journey um, is both... Um, a wonderful journey in the sense that you are discovering the unknown, but it's also a journey uh, which I don't think could be made again today, and certainly not in the gay, sort of happy-go-lucky, cavalier spirit that these chaps did it in. The team sped across Pakistan and picked up the Grand Trunk Road through India. The Grand Trunk Road runs right through the north of what used to be in, of the subcontinent, from Peshawar, right through to Calcutta. It's the, the link through the, through the country. It's not as grand as you might think. The middle of it is tarmac, and that's, they call it paka. And either side is gravel, and they call that kacha. And the tarmac is only sufficiently wide for one vehicle. So when you're coming towards each other, one or the other has to give way to move over to the left, into the culture, and it's a question of who moves first, you see. We did have some accidents, 
nothing very fatal, uh, I hit a, a bullock cart, uh, for instance, and that would have damaged the bullock cart, and to get that repaired, that was the man's livelihood. Um, so you realize that what you have done has a greater impact than it would do in the West. When we were in Pakistan and India, we went to any number of the sites that were more or less on the, on the, on the route. New Delhi, for example, and uh, the Taj Mahal, of course. You can't go past them. It would be like going to uh, London and not to going and having a look at St Paul's or Trafalgar Square. After the long haul across India, the Land Rovers had to cross the mile-wide River Ganges. One of our sponsors was Brook Bond. Now, Brook Bond runs an empire, which is a sort of uh, second division government. Every village throughout the continent has a Brook Bond man with a little stop me and go on cart. So if you actually want to do anything in India or find out anything in India or buy anything or do whatever you want to do, you go not to the chief of police or the chief minister, but you go to the manager of Brook Bond. So we went to the manager of Brook Bond in Patna, uh, who was almost weeping because he couldn't provide us with any elephants because a Bulgarian and Khrushchev had just made a state visit and taken all the elephants away. Uh, but he was desperate to do whatever we wanted. So he said we wanted a boat to cross the Ganges, and he said, dead easy, I'll get somebody to take you there in the morning. When we got to the banks of the Ganges, and they said, there's your boat, pointing at a little country boat with a bamboo deck, and said, that's it. When we saw the boat, it was very small, the width of the boat was only about the same as the length of the car. The problem was to get the car onto the boat very, very, very slowly and gently, because if you went too far, or you had disturbed the balance of the boat, which was flat-bottomed and, I would think, highly unstable, the whole thing might have tipped. The whole thing was imminent disaster, but made good film, and away we went. Having got on the boat, the crew hoisted the sail and they all uh, cast off and uh, lay down and went to sleep. And we drifted down the river and, until the sunset. And when we hit the far bank about seven hours later, the crew woke up, put another bamboo ramp down and off we went. The expedition headed north to Nepal to film Kathmandu for the BBC, whose viewers had never seen this part of the world before. The legendary Kathmandu, which was an absolute must-go-to for filming purposes, but it's not been possible to get there in the past. At that time, everything had to be carried in uh, over the mountains on people's backs, including the municipal steamroller and the British ambassador's Humber car. The Nepalese, um, extraordinarily sort of stalwart, stocky, uh, carrying these amazing loads, and one would see 12-year-old children carrying um, you know, 50, 60 pounds. Swinging on swings was the, the big recreation. Set up in the streets were enormously high bamboo sort of framed swings, um, 40 feet high, which passers by just swung and people watched. The team then drove via Calcutta to the Indian region of Darjeeling, famous for its tea plantations.
One of the problems that we sometimes had, a small problem, was where did we stay the night? And we were in Darjeeling and we were wondering this when we saw a likely looking tea planter. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we cozied up to him and he suggested we should stay the night with he and his wife in, in, in their home on the tea plantation, a little way out of Darjeeling. To get there, uh, we had to cross a bridge and the bridge was made, it said on the notice, uh, maximum load 10 loaded ponies. Um, we calculated that the weight of a Land Rover was about the same as perhaps slightly less than 10 loaded ponies. What we hadn't really worked out was that the ponies would have been going in single file so that the weight at any one point would not have been um, very significant. And I drove alone and the bridge went down and down in the middle and it was an extremely uh, frightening experience. We could see the weight of the Land Rover as it moved across the, the suspension. It actually, from being a curved suspension, it became an angle, with the Land Rover making the angle as it inched slowly across. One of the problems was he didn't know, the driver didn't know whether to do it at speed um, to get across before the bridge broke, or to do it slowly, uh, easily, gently, uh, to give the bridge every chance. But the biggest challenge still lay ahead. In order to complete the next leg of the journey, the expedition would have to cross into Burma. We knew very little of Burma. I mean, we knew about, we knew about it from newsreels of the Burma campaign and the war, but we had no idea what the Burma landscape was like. What was it? Was it jungle? Was it paddy fields? Was it, how were the people dressed? What did they do? This is where the uncertainty began. We were certain of our abilities so far, and there'd been no physical, even political difficulties. But from now on, anything might happen. We've no idea what the difficulties and dangers would be. Since the end of the war, there had been several attempts to cross Burma, but none had succeeded. The most significant reason was the, uh, the difficulty of crossing from India into Burma. There were no roads before the war. However, during the war, there was at least one road built, the Lido Road, sometimes known as the Stillwell Road, uh, because General Vinegar Joe Stillwell, an American, was the boss, basically so that he could get supplies into northern Burma to fight the Japanese, and also, more significantly perhaps, to get supplies into southern China that he could reinforce uh, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, the, the Chinese nationalists who were fighting the Japanese. This was the most expensive road ever built, probably still is, it cost millions of dollars a mile, through this very, very difficult country. But in 1945, at the end of the war, there was no economic raison d'etre for that road, and so it was totally abandoned, and by the time we got to it, you see, which was 10 years later, it had gone back to the jungle. One could just see in places the trace, and we were able to follow the trace. It was the Rubicon. If we could succeed, we'd crack the first great problem geographically of getting to uh, Singapore. We, of course, chose the right time of year. It was January. It was the, the waters were at their lowest. Um, so the technique, we, we would walk across the river, first of all, to see how deep it was and to move any big boulders out of the way. Tim often uh, did that. I don't know why, perhaps his trousers rolled up more readily than the rest of us. As far as wildlife was concerned, there are snakes, in, of course, in Burma, and some quite deadly ones, but I don't know that they go swimming. Before you went in, you would disconnect the fan belt, because otherwise the fan would throw water up onto the electrics. The second uh, step was to only send one vehicle in at a time, so that the first one went in and gurgle, gurgle. It could be pulled back by the one still on the bank and dried out and try again. Mm -hmm. 
Burma had seen some of the bloodiest fighting between Allied and Japanese forces during the war. Debris from the conflict littered the country. We came across a Japanese two-man tank, which we all played about in. It was just a shell. Everything, everything, everything had, had gone from it. Burma had gained independence in 1948, but fighting between rival ethnic groups now made travel through the country highly dangerous. The different tribes in Burma, of which there are seven or eight, um, all decided they wanted a, a hand in the government. They were extremely upset and they've been in insurrection ever since. They operated the, the opium trade, so they would attack anything perceived to be military or police. They also liked to uh, attack civilians for their gold rings or whatever was to be had by pinching. There was every chance that we would be ambushed, and since the road uh, was uh, very steep and with a lot of jungle around, and the road just about wide enough for our cars, uh, one couldn't have escaped. The threat was indeed real, because other convoys, the army lorries, which were the civilian buses, uh, all had several bullet holes in the windscreen and had been attacked in the past. It was straight, straight forward until we got to the Salween River, which separates what you could call sort of one, the major part of Burma from a eastern salient, the Shan state. And in that area we knew that there was a certain amount of trouble and the Burmese army had told us that there was a certain amount of trouble. How far the Burmese army were responsible for the troubles, another story. So when we got the Salween River, we found an escort waiting for us. Two very clapped out jeeps which um, broke down rather promptly about half an hour into this escort. We repaired it for them and then Henry, our mechanic, drove it because he was, he'd repaired it and he felt that he, he'd drive it. And um, you have to remember that three or four of us had done our national service so we knew a bit about weapons and weaponry. We didn't like the way they carried their weapons and at one stage I think Tim and or Nigel sort of took over the weapons from them. So we rather took over the escort and found ourselves not only escorting the escort, but also repairing uh, their, their, their two jeeps. With some relief, the expedition crossed the Thai border and arrived in Bangkok. From Bangkok, the final leg of the journey took them down the Malay Peninsula to Singapore. Since 1948, Britain had been fighting a jungle war against communist guerrillas, but the team saw little evidence of the Malayan emergency. Going down Malaya, the roads were excellent. It was the first time we'd really been on really excellent roads, almost since Western Europe. And certainly crossing the causeway uh, was a significant moment. And we, we knew it because we had it made, you know, another hour and we'd be into downtown Singapore and finished. We'd run out of road, so to speak. We'd, set, we'd achieved what we set out to do so many months before. As we came across the causeway, we were engaged in a, in a little bit of stupid dueling to see which car would be first to cross. I do remember one thing, however, which did rather upset me, and that is the Oxford car overtook us. <laughs> On the 6th of March, 1956, the two vehicles arrived safely in Singapore to a grand welcoming party. Fantastic reception with champagne and the, the press, and the absolute lot. I think somebody said to us that we'd arrived half an hour late. 
to which we said that we didn't think that half an hour was too bad in six months and we weren't running a bus service. <laughs> Difficult to express feelings after seven months and 16,700 miles on the road. But uh, the notion of uh, champagne and things like that was... Uh, we didn't like champagne much. I think we'd rather have beer. And there was some beer. But the real thing we wanted was our letters from home and the feeling that we could send letters home saying we made it. The film shot by the team was assembled by David Attenborough and shown in black and white on the BBC later that year. We got a marvellous audience for the series. I've forgotten what it was in terms of millions. But it was a very successful series. And you got the image that all over England, people were sitting in front of their television sets, this little small black and white flickering image and saying, wow. <laughs> the successful completion of the expedition soon took on a greater resonance. A rapidly changing world made much of the route both physically and politically impossible. It's been done very seldom since, and in fact, since about three years after we did it, nobody's done it, and you couldn't begin to do it today. I mean, think of the political problems of, uh, of Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Balochistan, so that means the Middle East out. The road from India into Burma, the Lido Road, that's completely gone. The only part of the journey which would be much easier is from southern Thailand into Malaya, where now that I gather there's a super highway with tourist buses going backwards and forwards. When one finishes uh, an achievement, you have a feeling of both of relief and elation, and a certain feeling of anticlimax looking ahead. This will never be the same again. I will never do this again. What can I do? I've got the rest of my life ahead of me. How am I going to? Uh, make it equally exciting. Uh, do I want to uh, go to the office from nine to five and dream of the past, this, this great adventure, or am I going to be able to achieve something which will keep me interested for the rest of my life?